Okay, everybody, this is Dr. Kaz. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, depending on when you're watching this video. This is the second installment in the development chapter. And last video, we were talking about the pre-embryonic period here that lasts for, from weeks one to two. And we were discussing cleavage and implantation. And now we're going to move into our next stage here, which is the embryonic period. And this is going to last from weeks three to eight. So the first part, of the embryonic period is gastrula gastrulation. And this is kind of where we're gonna see the development of some additional cell layers uh, in which we will then talk about their significance because they will eventually give rise to the four tissues of the body, nervous tissue, muscle tissue, connective tissue, and the epithelial tissue. But it's really crucial to understand that this period here is critical during the developmental process here. So we're going to see this at week three. And if you recall, we had the two cell layers, the epiblast and the hypoblast layers. And we're going to see here that the epiblast layer, which is the outer layer of our blastocyst, is now going to form our primary germ layers. And there's three layers to that. And this is where all of our future tissues will come from. And so those three primary germ layers are the ectoderm, the mesoderm, and the endoderm. So at this point, when we have the evolution or the development of these three germ layers, we can now effectively call our structure an embryo makes sense because we are now in the embryonic period. So one of the first things that we're going to see during gastrulation is the development of the primitive street. We're literally, you're going to have, if we're looking down at the top of our structure, you're going to see just this invagination, this streak here start to form. And basically the cells will start to push in on themselves in the epiblast layer. At this time near where the future head is going to be, we're gonna see a structure called the primitive node and that'll be at the top there of our primitive streak. And then we're going to see around the primitive node, all right, a, so, a small development of what we call the primitive pit. And so during this time, right, the development with the primitive streak, you're going to see the cell layers well, that didn't work out. You're going to see the cells start to push themselves inward into the primitive streak. We call that invagination here. And literally, the cells will kind of detach themselves and they'll move in between our epiblast layer and our hypoblast layer, and they'll form a third layer in between the epiblast and the hypoblast layer. And actually, I'll just show you kind of a quick picture. So this is what we're starting off with here. All right, so you see we have our epiblast layer, and that's that layer in blue, and then our hypoblast layer, and that's that layer um, in tan. And so we'll start to have the development here of our primitive streak. And at the top here, Right, you can see this is where our future head is going to be. We'll discuss more about this in a moment. But the cells just start to detach themselves and just push inwards. And they're going to create this invagination. You can see in this nice picture here, we're starting to get these cells detaching themselves. And they're just going to kind of start filling in in between the epiblast layer and the hypoblast layer. And eventually, that's going to yield us all right, these three layers, the ectoderm, the mesoderm, and the endoderm. And we'll talk about the significance of those layers here in a moment. Now, mind you, again, back here, when we're dealing with our just our two layers, remember on the top here, on the epiblast, that's going to be right, the wall here. That's going to be your amniotic sac. And then below, we have our yolk sac here. We'll come back and talk about those shortly. So 
the endoderm, the mesoderm, and the ectoderm are going to be those three layers that are going to be formed. Again, important to understand that these three layers are going to form all of our body tissues and all of our future organs here. So the endoderm right, are, is pretty much going to be the cells that are going to replace or displace the hypoblast, the lower layer. Right? The ectoderm is going to be the cells that just stuck around from the epiblast. And then the new layer that formed, the mesoderm layer, that's going to be the new layer in which those cells that came from the epiblast kind of pushed their way in between the epiblast and the hypoblast layer there. So the mesoderm is like the new guy, the new kid on the block here. So that's what we're going to see here, right, right in the middle. There's the mesoderm. But those cells came from this layer of cells here, right, from the epiblast or the previous epiblast. So this is occurring all right, pretty much in the third week. So by the end of the third week, you've got these three cell layers all right, that are present now. So from uh, uh, this, this, the kind of end view here, you can kind of see this development by week three. If you look off to the right here, here's our embryonic disc. So essentially, you know, at one point you're just a flat structure. And so you'll see the three cell layers here. And then we still have the amniotic uh, cavity with the amniotic fluid inside of it above that. And then below it, we have our yolk sac here. And we'll talk about what happens with all that. So now we're going to see a series of folding. It's almost like origami, right? But not quite as complex as origami. That's the folding of, of paper into little uh, uh, structures. Um, but here, we're going to start to see a folding period occur. And so this is going to happen right somewhere at the end of uh, week three and the beginning of week four or sometime during week four. So there's two types of folding that are going to happen. The one, the first one is the cephalocaudal. The second one is the transverse folding. So from uh, at one point, we're going to do the top and the bottom part of this embryonic disc. We're going to fold those down, and then we're going to fold the sides down with transverse folding. So let's kind of discuss the folding here. Okay, so our first of the folding is the cephalocaudal folding. If you dissect that word, cephalad is towards the head, caudal is going to be towards the buttocks area there near your rear end. And so we're going to see now, all right, during this period of time that the head and the rear end are going to kind of fold down upon themselves. Now, a big reason for that is, right, we're going to see the embryonic disc and the amnion, those areas are going to be rapidly growing, but not so much in the yolk sac. So if you think about it, the area that's rapidly growing is on top, and that just keeps getting bigger and bigger, while this area down here is really not growing. So you're going to see the amnion and the embryonic disc kind of just push downwards there and inwards to fold in on itself. So of course, you'll have the head over here on our left side, and then down over here on our right side, that'll be the rear end there. And so because the yolk sac isn't really growing at all, it's not going to affect the direction of this folding here. And so as a result of this folding, we are going to start to form the head and the rear end or the buttocks area there. Second type of folding is the transverse folding. Now this is where the embryo is going to start to fold in on the sides there, the left and right sides. So everything is gonna kind of move or gravitate towards the midline. Now in previous videos and in my class, I've always talked about that, how we're going to see during development, fetal development, how a lot of things are gonna fold and migrate towards the midline. And then you'll have a fusion of the left and right sides there. There are certain disorders when you get incomplete uh, fusion. And so you'll have conditions, congenital conditions as a result of that. So during this transverse folding here, one, we're going to pinch off the yolk sac. So if you look over here on the picture on the right side of our screen, you'll see the yolk sac has pretty much been pinched off. 
and the remaining connection between the yolk sac and the actual embryo is the structure called the vitelline duct. In the future, we're gonna see that become our mesentery there. If you recall from chapter 26, the mesentery was the structure that holds a lot of our abdominal organs kind of in place here. All right, so consider all this going on. Remember, we're going to see a nice fusion of the right and left sides of the embryonic disc here. As a result of this transverse folding, our embryo now kind of takes on a cylindrical kind of configuration. So if you look up here at our picture, you can see, right, the embryo now has taken this kind of more uh, cylindrical configuration. It's not so much a round disc anymore. So we're going to start to develop our, oh, I messed all that up. Give me one second here. There we go. All right. Um, we'll start to see all right, our, our uh, embryo taking on that form there, which helps to create our torso here. Now, as a result of that downward folding and that transverse folding there, the ectoderm, which is that outer layer, is pretty much going to be the exterior portion of the embryo. And as a result, obviously, as things are folding down and over, right, the endoderm, that's the third layer, that's the more uh, lower layer there, that is going to take up the internal region of the embryo. And like I said before, our embryonic sac, or excuse me, the yolk sac gets pinched off, and we pretty much will not see that all right, uh, afterwards there. And so that is our transverse folding. And during this time, during the, the, the folding period here, especially with the embryonic disc, now we're going to see, we're gonna talk about this, we're going to see the differentiation of certain layers of the embryonic disc. So let's start off with the ectoderm. As you recall, like I said just a moment ago, that is gonna be the external surface here. And so this is where we're gonna see one of our first tissue development here, the nervous system, all right? Our nervous tissue is going to start to differentiate out of the ectoderm. And so we call that process neurulation here. So if you think about it, okay, because the ectoderm is on the external surface here of our embryonic disc and our future embryo, right? most of the external structures are gonna be derived from this layer. Now there's a few exceptions here, like the pituitary gland, we know that's internal and the adrenal medulla. But everything else, if you look here, the epidermis, right? On the outside, your sense organs, all right? A lot of those will be on the outside of your body. Enamel of the teeth, all right? We know where that is in the lens of the eye. So. With the exception of the pituitary gland and the adrenal medulla, a lot of the tissues that come from the ectoderm, you can pretty much see okay, externally. So this slide here shows us all right, some of those tissues here. We can see, I'm going to zoom in here. We can see the ectoderm here, right, pretty much responsible for the epidermis of the skin. And we talked about it in chapter six, right, the epidermal derivatives here. So things like hair, sweat glands, nails, all of that, right? Also, we'll see from the ectoderm, our nervous tissue is going to develop from there. Our special sense organs, structures that we learned about in chapter 16. Right? And then, of course, some of the exceptions there, pituitary gland, drill, medulla, uh, enamel, the teeth, and the lens of the eye. All right, the mesoderm, that's that middle layer that we saw that originally came from the epiblast layer here. So this will be a little bit deeper. So the dermis of the skin. You'll see a lot of the epithelial lining to some of the vessels there in your body, blood vessels and lymphatic vessels, the serous membranes, those are all internal. And so the list goes on, I'll let you look over the list, but you can see now we're seeing some of the other type of tissue formation, right, of our body appearing in this layer here, muscle, connective tissue, right, epithelial tissue, those are the three remaining tissues, right, that, uh, that are found in our bodies here. And then the endoderm is the inner layer here. All right, that's that bottom layer that we saw as it's folding in itself. It's, going to re, it's pretty much going to take residence up in the internal layers of the body there. And so we'll see right there with the endoderm, right, the lining of the 
inside or the hollow structures of the internal portions of your body. So think about it. The epithelial tissue that lines your respiratory tract, GI tract, urinary tract, those are all inner uh, layers there that are derived from the endoderm. Several of the accessory organs of the digestive system, liver, gallbladder, and pancreas, and then we'll have some other structures here found from various systems, from the immune system, palatine, all right, thyroid gland, parathyroid, and thymus. So you can see that these layers here all right, are going to uh, form important derivatives here for the development of the embryo here. Okay. All righty then. So now moving on to our second layer, the mesoderm there, we're going to see right, some structure differentiation. And the first structure I want to talk to you about is the notochord. Right? So the notochord is going to be right, a group of cells, and they are going to be midline, midline, okay, affiliated in our developing embryo. And so they're eventually going to uh, uh, give rise to right, the central body axis and the axial skeleton. And then we'll also see this structure called the neural tube. And the neural tube is important because that uh, is going to be involved in the formation of our spine right, and our discs in the spine. And so actually the uh, nucleus pulposus, which is that jelly-like material there, are actually remnants of all right, notochord and neural tube expansion there. Then we'll see all right, the next structure here in our mesoderm is what we call the paraaxial mesoderm. So this will be on either side of our neural tube. Now consider the neural tube is going to be midline at the center. So then just lateral to on either side of that, we'll have the paraaxial mesoderm. And that's where the somites are going to be. The somites are like these little uh, block-like structures that sit on either side. And eventually the somites are gonna develop into, all right, again, axial skeleton. Then we'll get some more tissue differentiation for one of our four major uh, tissue types, the muscle. We'll also see cartilage, dermis, and connective tissue formation here. Then if we go further lateral, all right, so lateral to the paraxial mesoderm, now we're going to have the intermediate mesoderm, and this is going to give rise to our kidneys, ureters, and several structures in the reproductive system. And then finally, most lateral to that is going to be the lateral plate mesoderm, and that is going to develop all right, our spleen, the adrenal cortex, and our cardiovascular system here. And then also you're going to see formation of serous membranes from that uh, tissue layer. And now we're going to see when our limb development occurs, the connective tissue of our limbs will be found or derived from that lateral plate mesoderm. And then we'll also see on the, uh, on, in this layer, the head mesenchyme, if you recall, mesenchyme is that embryonic tissue that can pretty much differentiate into uh, uh, almost any type of adult tissue here. And so in the mesoderm layer here, the head mesenchyme is going to form connective tissue, all right, and muscle tissue for the face. So here you can see all of those different layers there. Right, so at the top here, here's the ectoderm, bottom, here's the endoderm. We haven't talked about that, but in the middle, we have our mesoderm. And so right here in the center is our notochord. Above that is the neural tube. Lateral to that, we are going to start to see our somite formation, the paraxial mesoderm. So we'll see a lot of axial skeleton uh, derivatives occur from there. We go further lateral out, and we have our intermediate mesoderm. And then finally, lateral to that is our lateral plate mesoderm, or mesoderm, however you want to pronounce it. All right, so our last layer that I want to talk about is the endoderm layer. This is that layer that all right, is primarily derived from the hypoblast layer. And so the endoblast, or excuse me, the, the endoderm layer is going to, at this point, due to the folding, right, this is gonna be the innermost tissue layer. 
as a result of that folding there. So think about all the structures that are gonna be lining a lot of your systems internally, right? So obviously the epithelial tissue that lines your GI tract, your respiratory tract, urinary and reproductive tracts, that is going to come from the endoderm. And then the tympanic cavity, which is gonna be up in your ear, your auditory tube there, again, that's your ear canal. And then we'll see, right, some of our accessory organs from the digestive system, liver, gallbladder, pancreas, right? then our tonsils, and then a couple of our glands, the thyroid gland, all right, the parathyroid glands and the thymus, all are derived from the endoderm. So again, these structures are gonna be found internally to our, our uh, tissues there as a result of the folding. So the next part of our, uh, of our embryonic period that I wanna talk about is the organogenesis period here. Obviously you can derive from the name that this is the part in which our organs are starting to develop and where we're going to form these rudimentary structures that for the remainder of the development period of our embryo and then fetus, all right, prior to birth, you're going to see the development of these specific organs here. So this happens once we've done all the folding and once all of our layers have been developed, those three germ layers have been developed. So we're going to see organogenesis, all right, at, by the end of that embryonic period. So that's usually by week eight. All right, so at this point, we're going to, if we were able to see the embryo, all right, that structure is going to look similar to the adult shape. So they'll have upper and lower extremities. And we'll see very simplistic forms of our organ systems having developed here. Now, this period of time though, all right, is crucial because all right, these organs and organ systems are particularly sensitive to these structures or these things called teratin, teratogens. And these teratogens are substances that can cause birth defects. And so you can see the examples, alcohol, tobacco, drugs, viruses, bacteria, and even some what we would consider to be benign drugs, for example, aspirin, right, can affect the development of some, if not all, of these organs there. So it's very, very important to avoid any of these teratogens right, during this period of time. And so that's why many medical professionals will tell pregnant women not to smoke, not to drink alcohol. There was a particular drug that was out a while back. It was called thalidomide. And at the time, right now, I can't think of what it was used to treat uh, patients for. Um, but unfortunately, it caused the fetus, all right, to have the, their limb development would be affected and they would have flippers, no lie, they would have flippers as a result of all right, that development uh, because of that drug there. All right, so this leads me to this part here with what we call the peak development period. Now this is where these organs are going to be engaged in a lot of high specialization development here. And so it's a very critical period of time, right? And so, right, it varies depending on, all right, what system we're talking about. So the example listed here is limb development, crucial between four to eight weeks, right? Whereas external genitalia will come later on, all right, at the end of the embryonic period and the, or, or the, all the way through what we call the early fetal development. And that's pretty much um, fetal development is gonna be from weeks eight to 38, all right? So we really, really, really need to avoid, all right, teratogens during that peak development period, depending on the system. So an easy, safe way to avoid that is just telling these people during pregnancy, do not take any of these substances and always consult your uh, family physician, right? As to whether or not something is safe for you to take. It's better to not uh, uh, 
partake of anything than anything. That makes sense. Okay. The last part here that I want to talk to you about, all right, is the fetal period. And this is pretty much from week eight all the way, all right, to birth. So usually about, about I misspoke, week nine to uh, week 38. So that's around, all right, the third month there of birth. So pretty much during the fetal period, all we're going to really see, because now, all right, the fetus is kind of taken on a, a, a similar appearance to an adult, all right? But now all we're gonna do is kind of just sit back and wait. And during this period, we're going to see the tissues mature and the organs mature and just continue on their development period here. But during the fetal period, we are going to see, all right, a lot of rapid growth, right, throughout our embryo. Now it's going to be referred to as a fetus. This is usually around week nine. So we'll see the fetus start to put on weight. We'll start to see the fetus start to elongate. I mean, there's going to be quite a lot of uh, different uh, development uh, uh, periods during the fetal period here in which you'll see uh, a large increase in the size of the head, for example, or we'll start to see, all right, the torso start to gain weight. So we'll, a lot of this is going to do, do, uh, happen, especially at the uh, end of the fetal period. That's when the baby, or excuse me, the fetus really starts to put on weight. So for those of you that are familiar with pregnancy, uh, and if you've ever um, had a child, you will see that we divide up the pregnancy up into what we call trimesters. And on average, a pregnancy will last close to nine months, right? anywhere between 38 to 40 weeks. And so easy enough, we divide it up into trimesters, first, second, and third trimester. Right? So during the first trimester, this is the beginning portion here. This is where we're going to see all right, our clump of cells develop into a, uh, from a zygote into an embryo and then into a fetus. So a lot of name changing goes on here in the first trimester. And then at that end of the first trimester, we're pretty much going to refer all right, to the developing organism as a fetus for the remainder of the period until all right, the fetus is born. Then we refer to it normally as an infant baby, what have you. So the second trimester, obviously, weeks four through six. Again, we're going to see quite a bit of growth here in the fetus and just during that time too with mom, we're going to see her tissues continue to develop, especially the placenta, the uterus, right? We're going to start to see some changes in other tissues in the mother and the breasts. She's going to start to see some breast enlargement as her body's preparing for uh, lactation and nursing for the baby. Then the third trimester, the remaining part of the pregnancy is week seven through nine, or months seven through nine, excuse me. And this is where we're going to see the fetus grow the most, All right? So we're gonna see some weight gain on the fetus. The fetus is going to elongate and get longer. And the same thing with mom, she is going to be getting ready, right, to, to deliver the baby. So again, we're going to see, all right, some changes occurring in some of the internal tissues there of the uterus, we'll talk about that. Right, but the third trimester, we're kind of getting ready, all right, uh, for the party. All right, we're going to have the birth of the child. And so mom's body is getting ready for that. So a lot of things can happen during pregnancies. You probably talk to some folks that have had pregnancies and you hear stories of, uh, from folks that have had pregnancies. And it changes. It's different from uh, person to person. All right. Some women will say, oh, you know, with all my kids, I had a wonderful experience, you know, for the actual uh, pregnancy period um, for all of them. Some varies. And even with the same woman, her first, second, third, how many pregnancies she's, she's had, those can vary also. Um, I know some folks that on um, their first uh, pregnancy was awful for them, right? Morning sickness, right? Weight gain, aches and pains, all sorts of things. And then on their second pregnancy, it was much better, right? And it's just, you know, there's really no rhyme or reason for us to, uh, to figure this out, all right? A, a common, common uh, uh, statement that I've heard from uh, women is uh, the second and third and fourth pregnancies are always easier than the first. You know, again, there's a lot of variables 
uh, that come into play on that one. I think part of it is is really not you. You're kind of in the unknown on the first pregnancy. You really don't know what to expect, right? And then on the the subsequent pregnancies after that, kind of know what's going on. So it becomes maybe a little bit easier, at least in the expectations. So they're just Point being is the course of pregnancies varies, all right, between uh, individual women and also, all right, between individual pregnancies, all right, for the same woman. So some of the hormonal changes that we're going to see right, during our pregnancy, the course of pregnancy, right, let's talk about the female hormones, the major ones, estrogen and, and progesterone. Now we know, right, in the first trimester, the corpus luteum, right, that's that degenerating follicle, right, after the mature follicle is ruptured, then that uh, uh, follicle becomes a gland in itself called the corpus luteum. The corpus luteum is going to be producing estrogen and progesterone in the first trimester as, right, mom, as the functional layer and the embryo are forming and the development of the placenta is occurring. Then once the placenta has developed enough, usually by the second trimester there, right, then the placenta kind of takes over that role of producing the estrogen and progesterone. So we'll see that in the second and third trimesters. So because of all of this production of estrogen and progesterone, we're gonna suppress follicle stimulating hormone and our luteinizing hormone. So as a result of that, right, we're going to see all right, both ovarian cycle and follicular development stopping, which makes sense, right? You don't want to continue ovulating if you already have a developing fetus, right, in the uterus. There's no need, all right, to do that anymore. So we suppress that. And so that will not occur during that pregnancy there. So these hormones, right, are going to help with uh, uh, with the uterus development and providing the uterus there, all right, with a, a, a hospitable environment for the development of the placenta and the fetus there. So we'll see, all right, uterine enlargement at that time too, especially in the latter trimesters there, we're going to see the breast, the mammary glands, all right, enlarging also. And then of course, we're gonna see, all right, fetal growth occurring. So the mom might notice that she's having to cut her nails more often and her hair is getting thicker, right? And part of that is also going to have to do with all right, changes in thyroid hormone. Also, we're going to see because we're prepping all right, mom's body all right, for the delivery process. And so we're going to see all right, certain joints become a little bit looser. Which only makes sense because right, if we're able to get ligamentous joints to relax a little bit more, all right, that will allow for an easier passage of the fetus through the birth canal there. And then obviously those hormones, estrogen and progesterone are going to help that functional layer of the endometrium right, increase and sustain all right, primarily at this point, progesterone takes over a big role in that. So a couple other hormones to talk about, right? Relaxin, right? Now relaxin for a while was thought to be the hormone that was primarily responsible for ligamentous relaxation, but we're not seeing that so much with some recent research. But what we are seeing with recent research is, right? Relaxin is going to promote blood vessel growth in the uterus, which is crucial because obviously blood vessels are going to provide the nutrients for the developing fetus there. And so relaxin is produced by both the corpus luteum and the placenta. Another hormone, CRH, corticotropin releasing hormone, again, comes from the placenta here. And this is going to play a role, one, in aldosterone release, Right, so unfortunately, this will cause fluid retention and edema, edema. Excuse me. We talked about that in our fluid balance chapter there, how that can occur and, and aldosterone's role in that. But we'll also see, all right, this corticotropin releasing hormone is going to help regulate with the timing of when the child will be born. 
And then we have our HPL, human placental lactogen. Right? Again, placental meaning it is being produced by the placenta. And so this is an interesting hormone because it really puts the fetus first and foremost and prioritizes the fetus. So what it does is it affects how mom is going to metabolize all right, nutrients in the body. So it causes mom to metabolize more fatty acids. And so this is great for mom because one, fatty acids are a great source of energy and the body primarily would love to uh, use more fatty acids because you get more bang for your buck. So mom's going to metabolize the fatty acids more instead of metabolizing glucose. Good. Because now we're able to save that glucose for the baby. But in order to help save the glucose for the baby, then we need to shut down insulin in mom. All right? Now, I'm not saying we're going to be shutting it all down. But what it does is it helps to suppress all right, the effects of insulin so mom's body isn't absorbing glucose out of the maternal bloodstream and it keeps it in the maternal bloodstream so it can um, then move from the maternal bloodstream into the fetal bloodstream. And so we save the glucose for baby. Prolactin, we're familiar with prolactin from chapter 17, the endocrine system here, but prolactin, right, we're going to see a huge spike up to 10 times the amount of prolactin is going to be released, right, from the pituitary gland. And this is going to, again, Make sure that mom's body is getting ready for the nursing aspect once the child is born. So we're going to see, all right, lactation, all right, occur from the result of the production of the increased production of prolactin. Oxytocin and human chorionic thyrotropin here, oxytocin, right? Again, we talked about this hormone and you should know this. It is made in the hypothalamus, but stored in the posterior pituitary. And so we talked about oxytocin helping with milk release from the mammary glands, but we're going to talk about how it plays a big role in uterine contractions. All right, this is a positive feedback mechanism as the head of the baby is pressing against the cervix there. We're going to see an increase in oxytocin, and so that will cause all right, the uterine contractions to increase. So we'll see a large amount of oxytocin present in the latter trimesters in the third, I mean, in the second and the third trimesters there. And then finally, our human chorion chorionic thyrotropin. Again, it is made by the placenta and this is going to increase, all right, the thyroid gland production here so we can help mom, all right, increase her metabolic rate. And a, and a, and a symptom of that, like I mentioned before, is gonna be the nails growing faster, right? And we'll see thicker hair that also is, is, is playing a role too, but also, right, we want mom to be able to take care of herself because she's got a large uh, responsibility. Her body has to provide, all right, uh, metabolic demands for both herself and also she needs to be able to sustain the developing fetus there that's, a, that's uh, growing inside of the uterus there. So speaking of the uterus, we have our uterine expansion here. I'll show you this slide here, a picture. You can see, we'll talk about that here. We'll, we'll see the different stages here. I will right, we'll come right back to that slide. But uterine expansion right, is going to occur as soon as the uh, embryo, all right, um, as soon as the Im implantation occurs. And so by just by 12 weeks, right, we are going to see right, the uterus start to migrate superiorly as it's growing and developing. And so by week 12, we're going to see it be just creep right above the pubic symphysis there. Now, one of the symptoms that mothers will complain about during pregnancy is the increased frequency of urination. And part of that is going to be a result of the larger the uterus, right, the more space it occupies. And so other organs have to kind of just get used to it. And um, so one of those organs is the urinary bladder. And so we'll see, especially from pregnant moms, I know it varies from person to person, of course, but definitely in the third trimester, they're having to get up more in the middle of the night to go and urinate, but they might notice the same thing in the first trimester, right? But not nearly as much in the third trimester. So what causes the uterine ex expansion to occur? Well, obviously we're going to see hyperplasia of smooth muscle cells 
in the myometrium, we're also going to see, in addition to the hyperplasia, the hypertrophy of those same cells. Right? And as the fetus is growing, the placenta has to accommodate that. So the placenta will grow and we'll start to see an increase in amniotic fluid. So all of that is uh, the uterus has to accommodate for. So now we get to week 16 and we'll see the tip or the fundus of the uterus is now gonna be somewhere between the pubic symphysis and the umbilicus. And then around week 22, then the fundus reaches the level of the umbilicus. And then by the ninth month, all right, the fundus has got, gone all the way up to the xiphoid process. And you remember the xiphoid process is the inferior tip of the sternum there. So at that point, by week nine, week eight, week nine, we're seeing, all right, quite a large expansion of the uterus. So we're going to have to shift some of those internal organs in the abdomen around a little bit. Thank goodness, right, we have the mesentery, right, in which the small and large intestine attaches onto, allows for that accommodation, allows for those tissues to move around. But unfortunately, there's still going to be some impingement on those structures at times mothers might complain of constipation, right? Because of the uterus pressing on certain parts of the GI tract there, right? But at that latter portion in the third trimester, we'll definitely see, all right, a large impingement on the urinary bladder, thus the increase in frequency of urination. At the same time, all right, as the uterus is expanding, we're going to see changes in other areas of the body, mammary glands, right, will start to undergo some changes there. First trimester, mom might be complaining of tenderness around the breasts, around the nipples here. And again, that is due to estrogen and progesterone um, being produced right, from primarily the corpus luteum, and then the placenta will start to help out with that. But one of the things that some pregnant mothers, and I mentioned this before when we were talking about it in uh, Bio 210, when we were talking about the linea albia, well, in pregnant women, the linea albia will start to darken, and that's because of the melanocyte stimulating hormone. And this hormone, right, is produced by the placenta, and so that causes darkening of certain structures. It's going to cause darkening of the areola and the nipples, and it's believed that that darkening, because um, the infant, their vision isn't very good at that in, in the beginning of their uh, newborn life in the outside world there, so it the darkening of the areola and nipples gives more of a target. So the baby, it's a little bit easier for the baby to see with its limited vision uh, to latch on. And then we'll also see the darkening of the linea alba, and which at that point we start to call it the linea nigra. And at the same time, we'll see, all right, increase in glandular tissue in the mammary glands there. And that is partially caused by increased growth of the number of asini there. So this picture here, you can see all right, the different stages of that uterine development at certain periods of pregnancy here. So obviously before conception, right, the uh, uterus is well inside the, the pelvic cavity there. And then uh, the second trimester, four months, you can see the fundus now is somewhere between the pubic synthesis and the umbilicus around Seven months here, we're now starting to see that the fundus is somewhere between the xiphoid process and the umbilicus. And then around month nine, we're at just below the xiphoid process there. And a lot of the abdominal organs are going to be moved around a little bit or impinged upon. All right, I'm gonna stop the video here at this point. And uh, we'll finish up in, in the third installment in Chapter 29, Development. I hope you enjoyed this video. Have a great day.